In this course, we'll be focusing primarily on Gang of Four patterns. But it's important to understand that there are certain common characteristics of patterns in general that are worth being aware of to make you more effective in your understanding and application of this particular approach. For example, patterns typically describe a thing and a process. The thing, or the what, typically means a particular design outline or a description of implementation details. And the process, or the how, typically describes the steps to follow in order to create the thing. We'll be covering more of this as we get further on into the lessons. Patterns can also be independent of particular programming languages. For example, certain patterns dealing with iteration are useful in almost all different programming languages. There are, of course, certain patterns that are more specific to a particular language or a particular style or paradigm of programming. There are patterns that are specifically useful for object-oriented languages. There are patterns that are more useful for functional programming languages or logic programming languages or concurrent programming languages and so on. The key thing is that language independence is often crucial in order to see the generality that extends beyond any given application of the pattern. Patterns also describe so-called microarchitectures. In other words, that's the recurring structure that we talked about before. For example, if you take a look at the observer pattern, it has a particular way of being organized. You have a subject, you have an observer, you have concrete observers that often inherit from the abstract observer and so on. What's interesting about this, of course, is as you start to apply the patterns in different contexts or different domains, they may change ever so slightly and be modified a bit. For example, here is one application of the observer pattern in the context of Android, where we have something called a content observable, which is used to be able to keep track of whether content changes within a database on the phone. And that's one particular way of having a variation or a modification to the pattern. Here's another example of the observer pattern in the context of Android. In this particular case, we have something called a broadcast receiver, which is notified by various parts of the Android system when certain properties change, when events are going to be disseminated, and so on. Same pattern, different realization, ever so slight modifications in the way in which the various pieces work. Because patterns aren't code, or even necessarily concrete designs, they have to be reified and applied in particular programming languages or particular contexts. For example, here's an application of the observer pattern written in Java using some of the key parts of the Java JDK libraries. So for example, we have something here called an event handler that inherits from observer, which is part of the JDK. We then have something called event source, which is going to inherit from observable and implement the runnable interface so it can be spawned and run in a separate thread of control. And then when we go ahead and actually define our implementation, we create ourselves an event source object, we create an event handler, we go ahead and we add the event handler to the event source, which is the subject in this particular case. We then create a new thread and start that thread, and then events will be disseminated appropriately to the observers as various conditions change. Here's another example of applying the observer pattern, except this time we happen to be using C++ with something called ACE, which I developed over the years. Same pattern different realization, and there are different variations as well. For example, this particular use of the pattern is combining observer with another pattern from the Gang of Four book that we'll talk about later called the bridge pattern, which is very useful in C++ to abstract away from memory management concerns, since C++ doesn't have the benefit of garbage collection like Java does. Another key thing to keep in mind when you understand patterns is that they are not methods in and of themselves, but they're really intended to be used as adjuncts to other methods. So you can use patterns with the rational unified process, you can use patterns with agile methods, various things like Kanban and Scrum and so on, and other methods as well. And of course, it's also worth noting that you can apply patterns in many other contexts besides classic software development. For example, there are interesting books on how to understand patterns that occur in organizations. So if you're trying to be a manager of a software development group, or you're trying to be an executive in a company that's developing software, there are books that describe patterns of effective organization, get people to be more effective, communicate better, get things done, make commitments to time, and, and get things done on time and under budget and so on. Most of the literature on patterns typically has some core elements in common. For example, 
there's typically a name that's given to the pattern. And that name is intended to be pithy and memorable. For example, when you take a look at the Gang of Four book, you'll see almost all the pattern names are one single word. A handful have two words, and only one of them has more than two words, chain of responsibility. But all these things are very short and to the point. There's also, of course, the issues that relate to the intent, which are basically the goal behind the pattern and the reasons for using it. Intents should also be very short and to the point. Problems are also key and very common in pattern descriptions. The problem is explaining what the forces are or the constraints or the context in which the problem arises. And it gives you a chance to understand whether or not what you're trying to do may be applicable to what the pattern addresses by concisely describing the kind of problem that's resolved by the pattern. Of course, the other key thing here is the solution description. And solution descriptions typically are a combination of text that says what to do, describes the various roles and their relationships and the participants and so on, as well as often diagrams that illustrate how to solve the problem, often using structure diagrams or some kind of interaction diagram to capture the key collaborations and dynamics between the roles and responsibilities. Those are the four typical things you'll find in almost every pattern description. Some pattern descriptions, especially pattern descriptions that are intended to be used by programmers who are going to implement the pattern very quickly, go into a bit more detail. For example, some pattern forms describe some examples and they provide you with some implementation guidance to lead you or guide you step by step how to apply the pattern for what it is you're trying to do. Oftentimes, they'll be described in a particular programming language, C++, Smalltalk, C Sharp, Java, and so on. And most developers find that a bit more reassuring when they can see that guidance and help them see how the patterns can actually be realized for real. It's always important as well in most descriptions to include a frank discussion of the consequences of applying the patterns. Sometimes we have a tendency to fall in love with our way of doing design and implementation and we start to not see some of the warts and quirks about a particular way of doing things. A well-described pattern, however, clearly identifies both the benefits and the liabilities of applying the pattern. So developers are in a better position to know when to apply it, when not to apply it, and what to watch out for if they apply a particular pattern. It's also important, of course, to document the known uses of the pattern. In fact, that's really what makes a design structure, a recurring design structure, recurring. It's what makes it a pattern. It is able to be able to find multiple known uses done by someone other than the author of the pattern document to illustrate that something's a pattern as opposed to merely being a design or a particular implementation in all of its full-blown idiosyncratic glory. So known uses help to give people confidence that what's being documented is for real. You can see it occurring other places. And naturally, as we'll talk about later, patterns don't exist in isolation. Patterns work together. They form relationships. So it's also often the case that pattern descriptions will describe other related patterns. And in addition to describing what other patterns may be related to a pattern, a pattern description may also explain why and when you would apply one pattern versus another, because that helps give you deeper insight into when to apply it versus when not to.